right, we're back with another episode of the BAT podcast. Welcome, everybody. This is Randy Nonnenberg, co-founder of Bring a Trailer. Uh, I'm very happy today that we have a super special guest, a member of the BAT community and the broader automotive community. Mr. Jay Ward is here from uh, Pixar and Cars fame, but also a lifelong history of interest in uh, vehicles and hot rods and cars and all kinds of cool things in the automotive community. Uh, Jay, how are you? I'm doing good, Randy. Thanks for having me on here. No problem at all. Uh, you and I met a number of years ago, um, and I think we met at the Brizio Hot Rod Shop, actually, of all places to meet. But you uh, knew about BAT at that time, uh, and I was up to my neck and figured out how to run this BAT business. And now we have you know, this huge audience and, and the audience listening here on the podcast. I'm sure they'd love to hear a few things from you today about you know, your history with cars, your history with BAT, obviously the, the movie experience that you have. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that people don't know about you and the stuff you're up to right now. And uh, I think we'd love to touch on all of that. Yeah, we can jump into all of that. And and you are correct. I'm a long time uh, Bring a Trailer. In fact, obviously back before you guys were, were doing car auctions when Bring a Trailer was about those cool links on Craigslist or eBay or, you know, weird stuff. I have a, a lot of friends in the alpha community and it's, it's the Alfa Romeo people that like know about, you know, looking down every little digital back alley to find a car. And that's how I found out about you guys many, many years ago. Oh, cool. That's I actually didn't know that. Tell us about the Alfa connection. I didn't know you had buddies in that world. So um, Matt Hamilton, who's a big Alfa guy, um, his wife, Stephanie, worked at Pixar with me. And she had a little group of uh, female drivers. I think they called them. They did something called the Snowball Rally. And uh, she sent out a link because you guys would also link when there was local car events or rallies and stuff. And so she said, oh, look at this thing, bring a trailer. And that's when I kind of went down the rabbit hole of looking at the website and finding, you know, weird cars and bikes on there. And, and just the way you guys wrote things, you know, as I read descriptions or what the link was, I was like, these are true car people. Like, the, you know, just, just what you wrote was like, you know, you want one of these, but the floor is going to be rotted out. But, you know, if you swap a, you know, Toyota 22R engine in it, this car is great. And so I was like, wow, this is truly a car person's website. So that, that was my introduction. Oh, that's killer. I love that. Yeah, that, I mean, that's early days of BAT stuff, pre-auction and running those rallies and some of that sort of Bay Area car culture type stuff. It's cool that you overlapped. Some people may not know, yeah, Pixar is based in Emeryville, California, right here in the Bay Area. And there's sort of a hotbed of automotive things going on in the East Bay. I know you call yourself East Bay J on your social uh, <laughs> social tags. Are you That's lifelong right. uh, East Bay guy or where uh, where did uh, the sort of roots of your uh, car uh, interests come from ge okay. geographically? Yeah. So, I mean, I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. My dad owned a car, uh, an automotive wholesale lot where he would bring home um, really amazing cars. When I was a little kid, our, our neighbors thought that uh, my dad was a drug dealer. Definitely. Cause he would bring home a, he could bring home, like, um, he traded a 68 grand pre for a, um, for not, it wasn't a Miura. What was it? It was a Ghibli. He had a, he had a fly yellow Ghibli that he had traded a, a Pontiac GTO and some money for that he brought home. It needed a windshield. The guy had flipped it on the roof. My dad knocked it out, you know, skimmed it, put a windshield in it. He brought home, I mean, all kinds of really cool cars in the 70s. He bought a 308 brand new in 1978, which I was like, we, we were not a, a big money family. So it was definitely my dad was a hustler in the car world, which I, I loved. And obviously that, that gave me the gearhead um, DNA. I moved to Oakland um, to go to art school. So as like a young man of 18, I moved to Oakland to go to California College of Arts and Crafts at College and Broadway. And um, I didn't even have a car because there was no room to keep a car, but I wanted uh, to, I was a motorcycle guy too. So I rode a motorcycle to school, a Harley that I built. And then um, I was always looking for cars. Yeah. So I've always been East, been East Bay and then Pixar is located across the street from Fantasy Junction and across the street from Easy Porsche Salvage. So like I had two of the best neighbors possible for the last, you know, 20 years at the studio. No, oh, it's so cool. Yeah. A lot of people ask me about, you know, Bay Area car culture because like SoCal obviously gets all the gets all the praise for, you know, automotive history and, and the different things that went on down there. But I always love it that, you know, Oakland and and some of the East Bay industrial areas. I mean, there was like car factories there, right? I mean, you can find different vintage cars that we sell on BAT that were built in not only Fremont, but uh, you know, Oakland and, and different, you know, areas uh, that are in and close by. So the fact that Pixar was there and then this whole 
uh, cars theme within your own studio there sort of, you know, obviously took off and, and went crazy with you right there in the center of it is, uh, is really a neat overlap. Yeah. In fact, Emeryville uh, was home of the Doble steam powered car. So Jay Leno is a huge Doble steam car guy and Doble steam car started in Detroit, but the two brothers moved to Emeryville and the last, I don't know, dozen or so cars were built in a factory in Emeryville. That's literally on the same street as easy Porsche salvage. So you know, deep automotive history, right, right by Pixar. And then, yeah, you're right. Uh, Oakland East Bay had a lot of Ford and GM plants through the years, which I always find fascinating too. Yeah. Super cool. So um, yeah, let's jump into a little bit of present day and what kind of stuff you're up to. I mean, obviously Pixar, when, when I shook your hand and was sort of starstruck, when I first met you, you were like all things cars, right? At Pixar and the movie franchise and uh, you know, I was kind of a kid at heart and I love those. And now I'm family man and my kids love those movies and everything else. Um, but obviously you've, you've been doing different sorts of things, um, inside Pixar and outside. Um, and people would just love to hear a little bit about, about, uh, the kind of things you're up to right now, automotive wise. Yeah. Well, and I'll, and I'll give a, a very super quick history of how all that collided because my outside car life, uh, became my at Pixar car life, but it started as being a gearhead before I got to the studio. Um, when I graduated art school at CCAC, um, I went to work at Bob Drone Harley Davidson in Oakland when they were on East 12th Street. They were in an old brick Studebaker dealership, and I worked at the parts counter and built a shovelhead motorcycle in my little tiny apartment living room, rode the bike around. And after a couple of years, I thought, I don't want to work at a Harley shop the rest of my life. Um, I went down to LA for a year to do freelance illustration, and I really got into the um, the traditional hot rod and custom scene uh, ended up building a, a 49 Lincoln Cosmo coupe that we chopped. And I was in a car club called the lucky devils down there. Went to Paso Robles, the big uh, classic car, you know, um, traditional hot rod show for the first time. And when I moved back to the Bay area in 96, I realized, you know, like you said, Randy, it's such a smaller scene up here. There's just LA, just like if you're into NSUs or whatever in LA, there's a club, but in the Bay area, you've got to like hunt and peck to find people that are into the same thing. And um, me and a buddy started a car show called Billetproof in 1998. And the goal was cars that you built yourself. You didn't have a lot of money. It could still be in primer. Um, the hot rods and customs that would kind of get poo-pooed at the big good guy shows were welcome at Billetproof. And we started that show, like I said, 97, 98, and it grew into this massive, uh, huge thing. We started at Albany Bowl in Albany, California with 26 cars, and it just grew huge. And I left that behind. I did another small show called the Asphalt Invitational that was invite only that we did in Hayward at Holiday Bowl. And that grew huge. And then when I started at Pixar, um, we moved to this new campus in 2000, the Emeryville campus. And somebody had ran a little car thing at our old location in Point Richmond, but it wasn't really organized. And they said, do you want to, you're a car person, you want to take this over? And I said, yeah. So I went to our head of HR and I said, hey, I want to, I want to turn this little Pixar car show into something more significant. And our head of HR was like, sure, what do you need? And I said, I want enough money for like t-shirts to make some placards for the cars, maybe get a live band to play. So they gave me some money and I went ahead and turned it into the Pixar Motorama. And it started as this employee only car show. I invited Fantasy Junction across the street to bring cars and they had the nicest stuff <laughs> come to our little humble, nerdy animator car show. And it grew from there. And then when we started making the movie Cars, uh, the director, John Lasser, was like, you're really a car guy. And I was like, yeah. So he began to ask me, hey, is this right? You know, is this right in this car? And I said, well, actually, a Hudson Hornet has a really tiny bolt pattern. You know, actually, older cars have bias ply tires. They don't have radials, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I did a whole um, auto 101 class for everybody starting on the movie. So they just got the basics of cars. And then at the same time, the Pixar Motorama began to grow and grow because the manufacturers heard about it. And they started sending cars from their archives to our event. So it all kind of blew up at the same time, right, right around when the movie cars came out. Wow. I mean, man, you just touched on like 12 things that we could go <laughs> deep on. I love it. That's the fast forward. I'm going to pull you back to, I love the pre Pixar, uh, Jay Ward and talking about bulletproof. I just, when you said that, I had no idea that you were part of founding that. And I, I wrote uh, back when BAT was tiny, BAT started in 07 and I just pulled it up. I just searched bulletproof on BAT and there's an article that I wrote in 08 and I was like, check out this show that these guys are doing. A, because this name is hilarious. Whoever thought of the name, it's, it's you know, magic. 
and I was just like, I love what these guys seem to be all about. I never, I've never attended one, but I remember when I tripped across it for the first time and it just kind of resonated. And I was like, that's rad. And that, so that was 08. But when did you start that up? Me and a buddy started that in 97 was our first one. And like I said, 26 cars at Albany Bowl. They were all, you had to be pre-65. And the reason why was we didn't want muscle cars there. Not that there was anything wrong with muscle cars, but this was about traditional rods and customs. And we didn't want it to just become this bland car show. We literally had a focus of you built it yourself, traditional hot rod and custom. And getting away from that very street rod scene, you know, that was so big where you had the old guys in the lawn chairs that didn't want you to touch their, you know, candy pink car with some name airbrushed on the deck lid. We were trying to get it back to the roots of where it all started. And um, people figured it out. They got it. It started with just Bay Area cars. Like I said, 20 something the first year, went to 100 and something the next year. We outgrew Albany Bowl. Um, We went in 99 for our third year. So 97, 98, 99, our third year, we went out to Martin Luther King Shoreline Park between Oakland Airport and Alameda. And it's it's technically park property. And he said, okay, you guys can have this car show here, but no burnouts, no, nothing crazy. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, we got it. Signed all the permits with um, <laughs> Oakland parks. What could possibly go wrong? And my buddy, Steve Sellers had this shoebox Ford with green seaweed flames and he had flamethrowers. You remember when flamethrowers were kind of popular on yes. customs yep. and he had the spark plugs hooked up to the you know, to the tailpipe and he shot 30 (laughs) foot flames that would just burn the eyeballs off of children, you know, for a mile. It was just gnarly. It was Armageddon. And we had a beer bong where you put um, an inner tube around your waist and it was staked to the ground. You had to run towards the beer to see if you could reach it before the inner tube snapped you back. Um, (laughs) It was, it was mayhem in 1999. Um, And the parks was like, yeah, never come back here again. We don't know who you are and ripped up the contract. And, oh, uh, from, well, from I, I didn't write this thing until 08. So, I mean, I, that was 10 years deep. Oh, I mean, you oh, were yeah, going yeah, yeah. way before yeah, I that. was, I was gone at that point by, by, by 2008, I had already left. I left Billetproof, I think in 02. I took the year off of 03. I just said it was already so big by then in my book. Yeah. Yep. And then, and then 04, I started a new thing called the asphalt invitational that got back to getting small and really getting, I wanted good cars. And, and I like quant, I like quality over quantity. I would rather have a, a beautiful display than a circus. And it was just, it was just a circus at some point. So we did asphalt invitational between 03 and probably, probably 08 or 09. And I still have people ask me, Hey, would you ever do the asphalt invitational again? That was like my favorite show of all time. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it, it just, you know, you know, once you have a family and other commitments, it gets really hard to, to do big stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. things have evolved for you, but man, it's cool that you have all those as your calling cards. I, I genuinely did not know that you were involved with those. So that's super, super cool for me to hear, but I did know. And yeah, like I said, we met at a hot rod shop anyway, that you were, uh, and always had been deep into the, you know, hot rod culture and uh, moto. I knew you were into moto as well. I didn't know you were a uh, a uh, parts counter guy, though. That's pretty that's pretty deep and and authentic there. If you spent, you know, that many hours of your days uh, doing that sort of thing professionally. But man, what a what a crazy journey. So that kind of takes us um towards today and the things that that I want to just ask you what you're most stoked on today it seems like you're one of these guys well there's there's two parts of it man I mean I'm, I'm kind of gonna fanboy geek out a little bit I mean you're kind of one of those dudes that whenever I've crossed paths with you nobody has a bad thing to say everybody's stoked on Jay Ward like when you wow. show up at a, at a car thing and that that's why I'm always wanting to just you know high five you or, or be near you and that's why I'm super stoked that you're on the podcast and frankly part of the BAT crowd is because uh, there's, there's a few of those folks in the car community and you just want them to do well. And so it seems like you're doing well. And that always puts a smile on my face, but second, secondarily to that, uh, I know you're just in, into some, you're always into some interesting stuff, right? Like these shows and then the Pixar stuff. And now you and I had a, a conversation a couple of weeks ago that you're doing some, you're doing some writing now about automotive passions. Is that something that's uh, near and dear to your heart? Yeah. I mean, I, I do have a couple plates spinning and I think you and I are probably wired a lot the same way. We can't hold still. There's always something to do. Um, I used to be the managing editor for a magazine called Hop Up and Hop Up's still around it for people that know old 
traditional hot rod mags their hop up was around back in the 50s uh and it, then it, it merged with another magazine called honk and then it all merged i think with rod and custom at some point but the little pages of hot rods well mark morton uh, down in southern california revived hop up uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s and i was the managing editor for the last three volumes of hop up um uh, eight nine and ten and then the specials and that got me even deeper into this you know higher end hot rod world and when Mark stopped doing that, I started writing for the Jalopy Journal, which is the world's largest online place run by Ryan Cochran. So I write for Jalopy Journal on a weekly basis still. And then um, I, I started getting press vehicles every now and then. Um, the, the guys who brought cars to the Motorama for us, it, you know, uh, Randy, when you, when you run a show, if a manufacturer wants to bring the new, you know, Jaguar F-Type, Jaguar doesn't drive it up. It's a local place that brings that vehicle it's usually like somebody who deals with media and fleet yep. and press vehicles right and they were like hey um do you would you ever want to you know borrow a car from time to time and i was like yeah well I, I don't understand and they said well you know if you you're in the automotive world and you do articles if you ever want to just you know write a thing every now and then we can just loan you cars and so i started getting press vehicles um and that's been pretty cool so learning more about new cars which i'm not, not really a new car person as much as old. There's some new cars that excite me, but obviously I love old cars because they're analog and they're beautiful. And, you know, I, I, if you look at what people get excited about on bring a trailer, uh, there there's an, you know, they love new cars, of course, but there's this thing about cars, pre safety, pre smog, pre emissions, pre impact standards, that it was just about design language. It was just about achingly beautiful design that, that, it was like a dream on wheels. And those are the cars where you get out and you look back every time you get out. <laughs> those are my favorite cars. And um, so, yeah, I, I, the new car thing has been good for me to learn why people want a new car and what's cool out there. And it's, it's just a, it's, it's a different standard, you know, of, of why you want a new one new car versus a different, it's just a different world. So it's been good exercise for me to learn how to write about that and articulate what it is about new cars. Yeah, that's super cool. And is, is right. I mean, do you fancy yourself a writer? Do you fancy yourself a driver? Do you like what's uh, talk to me about that sort of writing creative component? Obviously, you're a creative guy, you went to art school and, and you, uh, you know, have a lot of those talents, but was the written word and, and you know, putting together these descriptions and, and articles something that always tugged at you a little bit? You know, I'm not, I'm not a great writer. I think I'm an honest writer. I just, I write in, in a plain way. I, I did an article last year for Haggerty. Uh, I basically borrowed a brand new F-250 trimmer, uh, power stroke diesel four by four, and I hooked a brand new Airstream up to it. And I took my family across the country and then we went back on Route 66 and we stopped at every town that inspired the movie Cars along the way so that my kids would make an emotional connection to this movie we made that, that touched so many people. And when they went to the spots that we went to 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago, that inspired the movie, they're like, oh, I get it. That's, that's why Sally's Cozy Cone looks the way it does. Or, oh, that, that woman inspired the character Flo. That's cool. And for my kids, they got to understand how much our movie impacted them, that, that the movie Cars... Um, caused these people on route 66 to have um, to keep their businesses open because kids wanted to see where radiator Springs was and they drugged their parents on route 66. And so it sort of revived some of these businesses that were dying on the vine. So that was a unique experience that I got to do from, from doing this automotive writing was to, to have that adventure with my family and write a story about that. And that that's what I like writing about is, is unique experiences that people can share. That's super cool. Well, I hope people go dig up that story. I, I was poking around when we were talking last and went and ended up looking at some of those stories. And um, yeah, both the connection to the movie, but even independent of the movie, just the the Americana component of, of you know, hooking up a trailer and dragging it across the country uh, for me is still as as cool and inspirational now uh, as ever. And then in, you know, the, the sort of COVID flavor of that, of just sort of banding together and hitting the road, uh, in that sort of positive component of isolation, I thought was really neat how you did that. Yeah. And, and you're right. It's the, it's the COVID component of us having our own little hotel room to stay in every night. It was our place. It was just how we left it the day before, but it traveled with us. And I had never done it for an extensive period of time like that. And there is something to be said, for, for like style and RV travel. We had a blast. Every time we saw another Airstream go by, there was this sort of knowingly, you know, high five nod. 
And we actually had a double rainbow moment where we were going through the petrified forest and we pulled in and there was another guy with an F-250 trimmer pulling an Airstream that was almost the same. I was like, dude, what is the chance of this? <laughs> so he's like, oh my gosh, it was literally the, like the, the, the stoner double rainbow moment. And we just both started taking pictures of these two F-250 trimmers with an Airstream behind them. And um, I put it on my Instagram, the whole trip. And uh, uh, Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford was like, right on, I'm following along on this thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. So re really, really a, a, a special thing that we got to do. Wow, that's super cool. Well, he's authentic. He, uh, you know, Farley is, is deep in the car world and, and I'm sure you know him and, and uh, he's into BAT as well. And we're always just sort of stoked that we have uh, people out there that are as authentic as you guys. So that's cool that he saw that too. You guys have risen to a, to a, such an amazing automotive level, and it's it's so crazy to think. I love that some that a small Barry institution that started humbly like you guys did have really it's become part of the vernacular of the collector car world. You know, you read a story and they're like, "Did you see what this thing brought on Bring a Trailer?" You guys have become a a barometer for where the collector car world is going, and like who who would have honestly ever thought that you know, you guys would get these vehicles that are not only world-class, but like the stories have been told around the world of what a car sold for and bring a trailer and the story behind it. And that's to me amazing is you guys have had cultural impact on the car world. That's very cool. Well, it's, we feel super fortunate and it's way beyond me, right? I mean, the early days, this funny, you know, bulletproof story and some of the early stuff, I look back and shake my head at the early days of BAT where I was sort of pretending to be a writer. That's why I asked you some of those <laughs> questions, right? Like yes. I didn't, you know, I, I, I wrote for my high school newspaper. That's the extent of my training, <laughs> writing, right? And now all of a sudden there's, you know, thousands of people reading stuff. So I was very thankful when we could bring on uh, team members and other other expertise. It definitely started as me, but it's so much, so much bigger than that now. And um, for me, yeah, uh, the storytelling aspect of the cars and, and um, you know, why the, why the comment streams and the people that engage in them are so interesting and, and helpful and compelling, frankly, is is uh, the story behind each of these vehicles. And it's not just a, you know, vanilla, quiet sort of transactional moment. It's a, it's a, there's a depth and a texture to it that's really neat, which, you know, makes sense for hot rods like you were talking about and motorcycles and, you know, um, all sorts of stuff. So, so it has been a heck of a ride and a, a real blessing. And yeah, seeing the people that are engaged and, and reading it and care care about the cars that come across is interesting. So I wanted to talk to you about that a little bit. We've, we've excelled in some categories um, really deeply, and then we're just scratching the surface, which makes me think uh, I'm going to let a little bit of a cat out of the bag here, but you have a, a, a two-wheeled vehicle you're thinking of listing on BAT, and we've been riffing on a little bit. Um, can we talk about that one a little bit, but even before it potentially goes to auction on BAT? I think that'd be great. Yeah. You know, years ago, years ago, I, I got into Vespa as a little bit of coworker of mine again at Pixar, uh, drove an old Lambretta to Pixar. And, you know, I started digging around and scooters and motorcycles are some crossover in those worlds a little bit. It's not all mods versus rocker. Sometimes it's a mod and a rocker or a mocker now. And um, I was always a motorcycle guy. But when I first rode an old Vespa, I was like, there's something kind of cool about just a 50s or 60s era Vespa for just cruising to the store and getting groceries. And I, I built a couple along the way. And then I ended up getting a, um, a GS 150, which is like the high water mark of Vespa's, um, a 58. And then I wanted to get an old scooter for my wife. And my buddy had a Lambretta LI 125. And, and the LI 125 is not a fast scooter, but the LIs look really cool. And this one was sold brand new in San Francisco in 1963. Literally never left the Bay Area its whole life original paint, original tool roll with the Lambretta lettering on the tool roll, original spare spark plug, original key. It had the original tires on it, which were I, just out of safety. I pulled the tires off and put them on the shelf and put a new set of tires on for her. Um, it's just, it's a time warp. Somebody had a windshield on it at one point, I can tell, and they took that off and they had a mirror mounted on the cow, which they must've whacked on a car and put a little dent in it. So they pulled that off. But other than that, it's like uh, an original paint li-125 like i've never seen one so original wow that's really nuts and and sorry how long have you had it we've probably had it for man almost 20 years probably got it in 2003 2004 to go on some scooter rallies down in santa cruz used to have some really great vintage scooter rallies and i 
I used to have a fender light Vespa, the old, what they call the Farobasso, where the headlights down on the fender, they're slow. Oh my gosh, they are slow, but it's cool. And she had that LA 125 and we, we did this rally together. And, you know, over the years, again, you have kids in a family. She's like, I kind of want something with an electric start. So I told her, you know, if we sell the Lambretta on bring a trailer, we'll look for a Heinkel. Cause a Heinkel, when you guys just sold a blue Heinkel a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> um, it's got electric start. Like that's my weird vintage vehicle reasoning. Like, baby, look, we'll just, we'll get this other one. That's even more antiquated and funky, but it's got electric start. I was going to say, I thought you were going to get her like a nice modern, you know, Christian something goes. easy or whatever, but you're going even weirder down the rabbit hole. You're getting there a Heinkel. Like, well, like oh, that's man. my problem, right? This is all of our problems with, we, we, we have these weird justifications for getting this stuff. Shoot, probably never write it but i'll <laughs> i'll get it because i can't help myself <laughs> oh. that's that's amazing so yeah so anyway super weird that we've listed uh heinkels we've obviously vespas we've listed all sorts of weirdo you know corner case bikes and when you took first told me about the lambretta i'm like sure we'll listen of course we must have listed a bunch of lambrettas by now right like i know buddies with lambrettas and yeah we've listed so much stuff i go to search we haven't listed one lambretta on vat auctions after fifty thousand auctions i don't know what is going on but the, you're gonna break the seal on that and then the Jay Ward signature <laughs> model is going to sell for a bunch of money. And yeah. then we're going to get, this is how it works. Like two days later, we're going to get like 12 submissions for Lambrettas after that, because people are going to be like, did you see what happened? Yes, it, it, that's exactly what happened. And there's so many very collectible models of Lambretta, the TV 175s and the Jets and all those ones. My buddies are into those. So yes, you're right. This little humble LI-125 will, will break the mold and then we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you got to promise we're going to follow through on that because after this podcast hits, you're going to get 47 emails, people saying they want to buy it from you. And you got to, you got to, you know, promise us that you're going to list it on BAT. I know you I, will. I, I will. It won't go anywhere else. And I can't, <laughs> wait, to, I can't wait to do it because now it even has a better story. <laughs> Yeah, the so, famous anyway, LA 125. I love that. I love that. So uh, obviously that's in your stable. And um, yeah. do you still have an old wagon or tell me what else you're driving around these days? So the very first, I've had a number of cars that obviously the, the chopped Lincoln Cosmo Coupe went away many years ago. It did pop up on like eBay a couple months ago after 15 years. Of no something. way. Oh, yeah. And you're, you know that thing where you kind of want to buy back your first, you know, and then you, then you look and you're like, no, actually, there's a reason I sold it. Let that yeah, happen. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, so I've got a, I've got a 29 model a roadster that I built in my garage with hand tools. Uh, when my wife and I got married, that's been to Bonneville and back, um, that's going to go on 32 rails pretty soon. And I'll, I'll have that done at a buddy's shop who knows what he's doing better than me. Um, I've got a 39 mercury convertible, which is the first year they made the mercury and a convertible. And that's done in a Westergaard pre-war style custom, what you call a tail dragger with Zephyr bumpers and 41 studio tail lights. And then when my daughter was born, I wanted to get a 50s wagon. See, there's that weird car guy justification. Hey, babe, let's get an old wagon to take our daughter to school. Like <laughs> she's literally just come home from the hospital. And um, of course, any wagon wouldn't do. I had to go nerdy. And I'm like, I really want a two-door wagon. Okay. So then you narrow that field of 50s two-door wagons. Yeah, but Nomad's like, that's just too easy. Let, let's, let's go obscure. So then you start going down like the weird, you know, suburban wagons and the, um, you know, the Ford Del Rio. And you're like, no, no. And I find that Pontiac made the Safari two-door wagon, 55, 56, 57. Well, the rarest year is 57. They made 1,200 of them. They're 1,290 something. They're just not around. And I find a 57 Safari wagon for sale in Southern California. Guy took a picture of the sign sitting on a car, emailed it to me. I called the guy and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to come look at it. So I get a buddy with a trailer, literally brought a trailer took the trailer down to Southern California. We met Clint Eastwood on the way down, which is a different story. And then we get down there and this car is just like a floating tetanus shot. It's just, it smells like cat piss. <laughs> the interior's mangled. The, the trim is falling off. You could put your Flintstones through the floor. And I'm like, dude, I can't, I just, I can't. And he's like, Hey, you're not going to find another one. Hey, I'll throw in the dealer gold book, like the 57. I'm like, Oh no. And I bought it. <laughs> So we put this, you know, rolling tetanus shot on the trailer, drag it home. And literally I'm going around the driveway, coming up to our house in the Oakland Hills. And my wife's standing out there with a the baby. And she's just like, you know, right after the child, there's a lot of emotions. And she's looking at me like, dude, please don't tell me you bought that. And I was like, baby, it's going to be great. I'm going to put, you know, disc brakes on it and seat belts, And, and it's going to be so cool. And she goes, 
this is where this is where you know you have a good car wash. She goes, look, just make it safe. And I don't want it to break down and get it, get it done within like a year or two. And I'm like, you got it. Oh man. But those three <laughs> easy to agree to those three are yeah. all hard to deliver on. I think. Yes. Yes. But I put disc brakes on the front. I put seatbelts in it. I put um, electronic ignition in it and we had it running registered and on the road in a year and a half. Cool. Fantastic. Yeah. And you yeah. still have that one. And that was obviously a while ago. Your kids are growing up, aren't they? Yeah. My daughter's 14 now. So I've had the car 14 years and my, and my son's 11. And uh, yeah, that wagon is still like, it's, we 4th of July parade in town. That's the wagon comes out every year and we, we roll that. And then um, about five years ago, I, I picked up a 76 911 S and I love 911s, but 76 is not the year that I was like, Ooh, I'm really looking for a, you know, the 74 to 77s, as you know, for a long time, they got no love because they were the emissions cars. They weren't as pretty as the long hoods. They weren't as reliable as the SCs. They were not the anymore team. though, man, not anymore. Those things aren't deals anymore though. Nope. Are they? nope. You're right. In fact, now I got people calling me going, I'm looking at this kind of, you know, not great condition 77 and it's, you know, 40 <laughs> grand. And I'm like, what has happened to the world? This is nuts. Um, yeah. But my neighbor had the 76 actually it was just featured in uh, Panorama magazine. If anybody's a PCA <laughs> member, my little car was featured in the magazine last month. It's called little blue. And uh, this, this woman's, this is actually a cool story. If we got time for me to tell you really. Yeah, quickly. no, we want to hear, go for it. Okay. okay. So we bought, my wife and I bought this house. We bought the crappiest house in the nicest neighborhood in this town. And the house across the street was this mega large house, but no lights were on. Nobody was ever home. And I'm like, this is weird. Like our neighbor, this must be like their second home, or maybe it's in like probate and the kids own it. Like nobody lives there. And one day this little old woman comes out of the house, shuffles across the street to pick up her mailbox. The mailbox was on our side. And we met this woman, befriended her and super tragic. She lost her husband and both of her kids in a plane crash. Um, and she lived alone in this house for years. She was a re total recluse. She was the definition of a recluse. And she, my kids, she began to like really kind of come out of her shell because we were a family and she saw us playing and hanging out. We kind of got her to spend time with us. And she saw I had the old, Pontiac and the, you know, Merc and the hot rod and scooters and motorcycles. And she goes, you you, you work on old cars. I say a little bit. And she goes, I have a, my husband's old car in the garage. Would you, would you help me get it running? And I said, she goes, I, I it hasn't ran in a long time. I'm like, yeah, sure. What is it? And she mistakenly said, it's a 67 911 S. And I'm like, Oh <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like freaking out. <laughs> she opens the garage door and it's a 76 911 S. So it was a little bit of a, wah, wah, but um, it was an original California car, blue plates, sold brand new in Palo Alto, Carlson Porsche. Hatton moved from its parking spot in 13 years. So he, he died in the plane crash in 80, and then she drove it between 80 and 99. And then she started running into stuff and she couldn't drive a stick anymore. And she got, when the new Beetle came out, she got the new retro Beetle. <laughs> and so I said, I will totally fix this car up for you. I don't want anything for it. I just want to help you get this thing back on the road, honestly. And I would go over on weekends and nights and change the oil and do the brakes and put a battery in it. And, you know, I got it functional and she would write me checks literally like from her checkbook for the parts. And um, after two years of just like hanging out with her and learning her story, we got the car running and um, it's a, you know, those are 2.7 magnesium blocks. So they're, it still had the five blade California fan on it that makes them run too hot. Um, it, those cars just were plagued with issues to pass emissions and it was belching smoke. I mean, so much smoke that I go, you know what? I go, I think you're going to have to reseal this motor, take the motor out, reseal it. I go, that's way beyond my, uh, my mechanical skill. And so I got her some quotes to reseal the engine. And she was like, I, I, I don't, I don't think I can do this. I'm going to sell it. And, and keep in mind, this is like 20. 15. So the car wasn't super valuable at that point. When you looked at the cost to reseal the engine versus what you could buy a 76, you know, with some dents in it for, it was like, it honestly was almost penciled out. So I told her, I said, you know, if you're going to sell it, I, I would buy it for you. And she goes, well, you did all this work on it. I'm not I, literally like, I'm just going to, you know, let's work on a price. And so she sold the car to me for a very good price. She was super cool about it. She just wanted it to go to me. And it turns out um, I just kept fixing it up and driving it and the smoke got less and less. It didn't, it, it didn't need a reseal as bad as we thought. It just had so much crud in it that it took about months for all that crud to burn out of the motor. And um, it, it has not been fully resealed. I've done some things and I did a 
factory oil cooler kit and 11 blade fan and did a lot of work to it, but I haven't ha- knock on wood so far. The engine hasn't had to be rebuilt yet. That's the miracle moment, man. Just put miles on it and the problem solved themselves. That yeah. never happens. Yeah. 2.7s for people that know Porsches are like, Oh, you know, they're um, this is the blessing of that car. It never got turned into a fake turbo. It never got a slant nose. It never got raced. It never got owned by some squid who was like, you know, ripping through the poor 915 transmission. It was literally driven by an old lady for 29 years, you know, or or 20 years. And that's the saving grace is that car never got into the hands. You know, most of those cars ended up with people who couldn't afford to take care of them. That's the truth. And because she was an old lady, she serviced it at the local shop the right way up until the time she stopped driving it. So the only, you know, sin that car had was it wasn't stored well. And that, that, that's not the end of the world compared to somebody who's beat the tar out of it. And somehow, some way you got one that's a nice, beautiful blue and not brown or <laughs> <Yeah>. cream or <laughs> yellow cream brown that's or right. whatever, right? And, I mean, and, and the black blue interior, it's not, it's not, yeah. and I'm, I'm not a big fan of the cork interior. It actually has that black. I wish it was tartan, but it's the black blue interior. It's a sunroof. It's a five speed. It's got, um, it's got the alloys on it. it you know, the Fuchs it's got, um, the guy put a, a blau punked stereo in it in 1980 and San, from San Francisco Soundworks. It's got all the receipts. Like it's a little, <laughs> it's a little time capsule. It had the alarm system with the keypad and the glove box and the big honking alarm, alarm, you know, a bullhorn in the trunk. I pulled that off. Um, it's just, it's an awesome 1980 time warp that never got modified. And, and, you know, most of them got some kind of funky thing done to them. This car has no metal work other than just the little things that she ran into. It's just, it's truly, it's an honest, honest 76, 911 S from California. So I, I really love it. Super cool. Super. And you'll super see cool. it. You'll see it down at the track on Saturday. I'm going to be at your BAT event on Saturday with it. So come and say hi. Fantastic. I'm stoked. I didn't know you were bringing that. I didn't know what you were going to uh, drag out. So that thing coming is a, uh, is going to be fantastic. So that'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll give a little plug for that since you mentioned it. Obviously we are back with a BAT alumni gathering at Laguna Seca on Saturday uh, at Monterey, which is a huge event, sort of home turf event for us that in 2019 was the best event we've ever put on and then 2020 obviously we couldn't do it we were so bummed so we are kind of roaring back and excited for this year so you'll be there and 150 other BAT style cars are going to be there many of them bought uh, on BAT so it's gonna be fun I, I can't um, recommend it enough I went in 2019 and the, the the cars that were there were absolutely bitching I mean it was really, kind of nuts it was oh, kind of nuts yeah. right we didn't even know what we were in for and it turned into like my favorite car show I've been to in a long time you're a car show guy like we we, we pulled that out of thin air but I, I don't know. I don't it, know. Was, it was fantastic. I was like, um, this is kind of like an unknown gym happening right now at Monterey. And you guys had t-shirts. I got a t-shirt from the day and uh, walked around, look at these cars and like literally so much good stuff in that infield. Yeah, uh, I'm stoked you guys are doing it again. I, I honestly think you're going to have more spectators this time because the word had to get out how good the caliber of cars were at that thing. Yeah. Well, we are not aces at, at PR or event planning, but somehow <laughs> we had a bunch of cars in one place at one time and it was pretty magical. So we'll, we'll see if we can uh, reproduce that. So that's going to be fun. And, and part of that show that you just touched on and part of what's cool about hearing you talk about Porsches and then hot rods and then Lambrettas and then, you know, all your different cars that, that you've uh, touched over the years, you know, Hudson bolt circles. Um, <laughs> it's just that variety, I think really um, speaks to folks, you know, that sort of diverse level of tastes and ability to get stoked on a European sports car, but also an old pickup truck and also, you know, a rusty restoration project. Uh, I think you sort of epitomize that. And obviously BAT is like schizophrenic variety it, like, drives people, <laughs> drives people totally crazy. Yeah. Right? And you know, what I do think you think about that? I think what it is, is okay. Everybody's a car person, right? Like, I mean, everybody in our circle are car people, but then within car people, you know, w- when you see somebody with a Mustang, a 65 Mustang, let's just take that. Cause it's kind of one of the more common old cars. You go, okay, cool. You got a 65 Mustang coupe, but then you see a 65 Mustang fastback and you're like, oh, bitch. And I really, I like the fastbacks. Those are cool. Then you go a little bit further and you go, oh, wait, it's a 350 H it's the Hertz car, black and gold. Like it, it's kind of like, I think most BAT people are like me. You, 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 you want the stuff that everybody else likes, but you want that weird version. You want that rare version. <laughs> you want that double take version. And I either go nuts for 
a story, like a real story about a car, patina, like straight up original, not faked patina, or the model that was the weird funky model. It's got to be one of those three for me, because if I'm going to go out and get a 65 Mustang for my daughter's first car, I'm not going to get a Wimbledon white coupe. There's nothing wrong with that, but I, I'm just going to go for the weird one. I'm going to want a two plus two in the weird color with the pony package, you know, or whatever. So I think that's why the bring a trailer crowd gets so buzzing about stuff is that everybody, especially in the comments section, they can look at the car list and go, do you realize that has, you know, the X, Y option that they only offered for half a year that was code Z, but it was only done at this plant. And that makes people geek out. We're all just a bunch of car geeks. Yeah. That, I mean, that definitely does it for me too. And even though I am, honestly, I don't know if it's time or you just don't see them parked you know, on every corner uh, in your neighborhood like you used to in California. But if I see a Wimbledon white coupe, as long as it's a V8, I have trouble getting excited about a six cylinder. But as long as it's a V8, even if it's got an automatic coupe, which I would have turned my nose up, right? When I was driving my <laughs> fastback, I wouldn't give that person the time of day, right? But now if I see somebody, you know, actually out there driving, uh, you know, uh, 289, three speed, uh, Wimbledon white coupe with hubcaps and a V8, I'll be like, okay, I can, I can kind of have that conversation again, you know, where totally. I was a super fastback snob forever, you know? Think, think about the 914. Like that was the car, at least when I was in high school, my buddy had a 914 and I remember the girl going, nice Porsche, too bad it's a Volkswagen. And she like, <laughs> you know, did the like flip turn on and walked away and we're all like, oh, you got burned, dude. The 914 now is like a really cool car, you know? <laughs> Um, but back then, I, you're right. There used to just be more old cars daily driven, I think. And That's good. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 914s were parked on the corner everywhere, yeah, you everywhere. know, everywhere you went. And so it was like, yeah, you weren't going to give. That was like a high school kid's car. That wasn't like a serious car. Right. And but now super different uh, times have changed, man. Yeah, for sure. And I think those cars that used to be the Rodney Dangerfield of the cars world, those those sometimes get more love. You know, we featured the. Um, the gremlin and the pacer in the second cars movie. And we had to track down the owners of these vehicles because the, they were the lemons, the, 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 the cars that were never loved, but they have their own love. Now, all these cars have a following. So it's cool. Yeah, for sure. So uh, something I always like to ask people that, uh, you know, have an interesting perspective and, and who I respect um, that come on the podcast is, like what stuff are you excited about in the car world right now? Or what people uh, are doing stuff that you respect that you kind of pay attention to um, out there in the, in the car universe? Well, there obviously, you know, there, there's a whole spectrum of um, talent and money levels. Like, you know, if, if, if money is no object, the stuff that Rod Emery is doing in the Porsche world is, or, or singer is doing is mind blowingly cool. Or what, what uh, Jonathan Ward is doing with icon Uh, is extremely cool. If you have a, you know, if you have the pocketbook for those kind of cars, they're amazing. It's honestly crazy to think that you could take any vintage car from the fifties or the sixties and bring it to the level that people can bring these cars to now. I I think a lot of younger people don't realize when you look at um, cars that were customized back in the fifties and sixties, some of the work really wasn't that good. Uh, a lot of the bodywork was was hinky. Uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of just weird kludgy stuff. The level of talent that exists in the cars world, coupled with technology and better tools, you can get some insanely good retro style cars now that are, you could have a daily driver that, that would do anything that a modern car would do in terms of handling and power and still have the beautiful looks. That That was always a compromise, you know, up until 15, 20 years ago. Now you can truly have, like I said, you could have a 49 Merc that has a Tesla drivetrain that goes like stink. That, that, that wasn't possible. So, so that, that, that's intriguing to me is what they're doing now with these cars, this retro futurism version of classics uh, where they're updating them in this tasteful, clean way. It, it's amazing to me. It really is. Yeah, I feel lucky that that um, a couple of those cars have passed through BAT and and I haven't gotten too much hands on time with with uh, I know the derelict uh, Merc that you're talking about with the electric powertrain. I haven't I haven't spent too much time with electrified classics yet. I do think that's going to be a uh, monster market in the future. And we've we have an electric category on BAT that I never thought we would have. Right. And and uh, people are doing some interesting super interesting stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of sitting a little bit on the sidelines waiting to see what happens with that, but on some future projects to do 
that sort of thing. Um, and definitely the type of craftsmanship you're talking about. Uh, yeah. I really, yeah, I really respect it. Yeah. Zelectric is another good example. Those guys doing the 911s and, yep. you know, they'll always, or a 912 and they'll, and they'll take the original motor and seal it up and put it on a shelf that I'm all about. Like, don't, don't do something silly and chuck it in the bay. But, um, you know, there's something about preserving that original drivetrain and yet getting miles on the car with an electric motor. I'm, I'm okay with that. As long as you got the stuff to put it back in, I'm going to be on a, a panel at Pebble beach, um, this next week where we're going to talk about what Pebble beach will look like, you know, in the year 2050, you know, or 2040, what does it look like in the future? Like where, where does this go as electrification is getting pushed in and we have a new younger generation coming in, are they going to appreciate 20s and 30s era cars or Duesenberg's going to stay the hot ticket 20 years from now. And there's a lot of things to unpack from that, where, where the car market is going is, as you and I are getting to be the older generation now, what happens to that 25 year old uh, guy with money coming into that world? What, who's starting their collection now? What does that look like as, as he gets older or she gets older? And what's your perspective on that, man? I'm I'm super excited to see where it all goes. Some people, you know, some people are, you know, sky is falling and nobody's going to like cards and stuff. I, <laughs> I, I'm kind of on the, I'm on the other end of that uh, coin and um, just super excited to see where it goes. Like, I'm not a good predictor of where it's going to go, but I uh, am super stoked to be at the age we are and to see stuff that's out on the road and to see the creativity that's being um, expressed in all sorts of different ways in, in the car hobby, but where, uh, can you give us any Cliff's notes on your perspective of what you're going to share with that crowd? Well, I think, you know, you, you look at, again, going back to what we have with technology, you and I were saying, you know, when we were young, a, a 65 Mustang that got beat up in a car accident would probably go to the junkyard and, and that car won't go to the junkyard anymore. There's no way. So more cars are getting saved and more cars are getting preserved. And I think that's good. And, um, I hate to say, but even like the movie Cars has inspired this little generation of kids, maybe that wouldn't have cared about old cars to all of a sudden want a Hudson Hornet. So trying to do my part to keep the next generation inspired. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to continue. It, it may be different. It may evolve. Uh, what's, what's hot? I mean, Bring a Trailer is showing me what's hot, hot right now, that the stuff that brings money, um, people people buy what they relate to, right? And, and if a young person went to high school in the 90s or 2000s, what, what car was on there, you know, what poster was, was on their bedroom wall. You know, for me, it was a, a 959 and a Lamborghini Countach for that Alpine stereo poster. Um, <laughs> right. Same, but, same here. Same. Yeah. That 959 poster had the black rocks and the pink neon tube. I love that one. <laughs> totally. Um, that dude, that was no joke. Uh, yeah, that was the one on the wall. I'm not making that up. It, it was actually right. fold out. So it had creases yes. across it because right. it, was a, it was a factory <laughs> brochure that you folded open that's it. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, that that was the poster <laughs> on the wall, dude. We had the same poster. I love it. And then every year, I think it was Alpine or Alpine Stereo did that uh, Lamborghini Countach poster. And uh, that was always collectible, too. It was always the silhouette of the Countach. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And and the kid now, you know, look at what this what you're you guys just sold a Supra, right? Like a, the, the Supra that broke two hundred thousand dollars a couple weeks ago. And everybody's talking about that. And that's that's past my era, right? That's getting into, into nineties. And so, yeah, it, it's just interesting to see what's going to be future collectible. What will get invited to be at a Concours 20 years from now? Like what, what, what designates a car to be the greatest of all time in its era? Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. It's going to be that, that discussion will be cool. And I, I just like, I think that there's more of a sort of future focus right now than there ever has been. Like the fact that you guys are even having that conversation at Pebble, right? Like when people think of Pebble Beach, they think of, you know, brass headlamps on the lawn and people getting ribbons <laughs> with big hats and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or at least it was in the olden days. But I mean, there's going to be a, uh, yeah, Lamborghini Countach just class at Pebble this year, right? I mean, that's that's kind of crazy. And there's, uh, you know, and, and all these discussions and a lot of media around it and, and different sorts of thoughtfulness around next generation type stuff, which, which I just think is really encouraging. So that's why I'm on the, in the optimist camp, man. I, I think it's going to be um, super interesting what's upcoming, but I wanted to do, we just touched on that brochure. I'm not going to quite let it go. We did a <laughs> podcast five episodes ago with Freeman Thomas. Yeah. Um, 
car designer extraordinaire yes. and he's like oh yeah i was involved with the 959 and i was like how were you involved did you design the door handle what'd you do and he said i designed the brochure the silver brochure with the pictures in it and the layout and the, he was like junior at the time and so he wow. did the brochure he did that brochure so the bat podcast has had Jay Ward on it, and it has also had the designer of the 959 brochure, which oh. I think is kind of a full circle freak out moment that seven people that are listening out of the thousands that listen to this <laughs> are going to relate to. Freeman is a cool guy. I, I, I'm i very, very lucky. I get to judge at Pebble Beach. I've done that since 2015. That is honestly, truly, truly high water for me. Like, I, I wish my dad was alive to see what I'm doing now. But um Freeman Thomas is a co-judge and I was walking around with him one year and I was looking at his watch and he had this really cool Omega watch. And I go, this guy just gets it. You know, like Freeman's just got good taste. Like now he's into the Manx, Myers Manx, but, but he bought a, he bought a black Dino coupe from fantasy junction across the street from us back when those cars were about one fourth of what they cost now. And I was like, <laughs> he just gets it. I just, that guy's awesome. Yeah, I felt really lucky that we could talk to him about that stuff and Manxes and, and all that universe. But anyway, didn't want to derail us, but that uh, no, the no. Brochure, uh, triggered <laughs> triggered my, you know, 11 year old Randy Nonnenberg thoughts of, uh, of having that thing on the wall. So, hey, man, well, I'm going to wrap us uh, after that. We touched on all sorts of topics. I feel like we could talk for three more hours. Um, sure. And I'm so stoked that I'm going to see you uh, at the BAT alumni gathering at Laguna. And we're both right in the Bay Area, so we get to cross some paths, which I I feel really fortunate about. Um, Same here. And you got to keep me posted. You know, you got your finger on the pulse, man, of so many shows and cars and interesting things going on. So I uh, I kind of want to tag along whenever I can. Hundred percent. And I did forget. There's one other thing I wanted to tell you before we run out of time. Um, I've been working on a live action project of my own, um, and it's about the history of board track racing, motorcycle board track racing. Oh yeah, like let's that. hear about that. I want I want to hear about that. Yeah, really quick, if it's okay. So about uh, 10 years ago, I started writing a father-daughter story and using board track motorcycles as the backdrop. Because for those of you who don't know, um, they raced motorcycles between 1910 and 1930 on wooden tracks, banked ovals. The, the, the motorcycles had no brakes and no clutch. And these guys were doing over 110 miles an hour in the teens with a leather football helmet, a sweater, gloves weren't considered manly on bare wooden boards. So these guys were getting in wrecks and dying and crashing like on a regular basis. And it was Harley, it was Indian and Excelsior like going for it. And so I wrote a father daughter story with that as the backdrop where he was this aging guy who had aged out, but he had this daughter who was born who had this natural ability, but he knew how dangerous it was. And for me, it was like, now that I have kids and you have kids, it's like if your daughter came to you and said, Hey dad, I really want to get into like, um, you know, squirrel suit jumping off of cliffs be like, man, I love you. And I want you to follow your dreams, but I could also see you getting killed. So I'm, I, I don't know what to do here. And so that's what happens in this story. So I wrote it like 10 years ago, kind of wrote it out as a feature and literally a couple years ago, some, some guys heard the pitch and gave me development money. I got a script written and, and I right now we're very close to having an offer to fund the film to actually make this movie. So uh, knock on wood, we're getting very close to having this board track film come to reality. So that's a, been a passion project of mine for a decade that I'm super stoked is uh, looks like it's going to happen. Wow. That's super cool. Yeah. That whole era, there's some interesting machinery that came out of that, that it, it sounds like your uh, story may delve into a little bit of that detail there, huh? Very much. Yeah. I did a lot of research for it. There's a great, a number of great books. Uh, Don MD did one called the speed Kings that came out a couple years ago. Um, Stephen Wright, who was a Bay area guy who passed away. He was down in Pacific Grove area. He wrote the book on American racing motorcycles. And the more I started reading, the more I was like, how come there's never been a movie that's featured these bikes? They're so amazing. So I'm excited if I can bring it to fruition with like a 10th of the juice that Ford versus Ferrari had, I think we got a winner. Wow. Killer. Well, if anybody can do it, man, I'm sure that you can do it. So I will uh, be sitting uh, as your as your main cheerleader on that project and your other stuff. I'm sure others here in the audience will do the same. Um, and yeah, thanks for uh, making sure we, we mentioned that right here at the end. So Jay Ward, want to really uh, uh, appreciate, uh, extend my appreciation for you joining today and uh, for being part of BAT, for uh, being on the cusp here of a, your first listing on BAT, which will be a fun ride, um, <laughs> and for talking about all this sort of stuff. I really do think you contribute super positively to the overall car community and, and um, yeah, just being able to have a conversation with you here and have everybody hear it is a lot of fun. 
Thanks, Randy, so much. It's been awesome just talking to you. Is it's just like sitting in the garage talking to another car guy. So I love it. Yeah, well, we'll do that for real with beers and a car in front of us before long. It's a deal. Okay, talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you.